Measurement is a topic that we typically teach in September or soon into the school year. It's a topic where, for me, and I think students in general, it's difficult to get that excited about. Because if you think about most of the types of chemistry measurements that we make, at least in my chemistry classes, it really isn't that critical. Is it 7.10 centimeters? Is it 7.1? Or is it just 7 centimeters? There's an awful lot of life that can happen uh, where we say, hey, I put eight gallons of gas in my car. It doesn't have to be 8.00. But it is important for, I think, students to recognize that all measurements, all measurements contain some degree of error. And it depends upon the type of instrument that you're using, how much error there is. One activity that I love to use in my class would be something called the measurement challenge and I can use it in a couple different ways. One is, hey, we've been talking about measurement in our chemistry class and how, how we read the ruler, how we focus in on the smallest increment, and how we can, in theory, break apart that smallest increment into 10 equal divisions, and we can estimate that last digit. It's not necessarily an easy thing to do, and they've had a lifetime of experience where they kind of say, hey, I just moved it right to the line, so it's exactly 7.2. When we try to teach, it might be 7.20. Well, the activity that we use for this, the measurement challenge, involves the concept of density. So you could use this as part of the matter unit, or you could use it as you make the transition from the measurement unit into the matter unit where density is a property. If we look over here at the density equation, we see again that density is equal to mass divided by volume. Well, that's a very nice idea. And where I use this activity, it is purely a mathematical relationship. I want them to recognize this relationship, but teaching chemistry to students who can solve for the missing variable, teaching chemistry to students who cannot solve for the missing variable. I don't want this activity, to, the success of this activity rather, to hinge upon their mathematical skills. So I'll even go further and we'll say density times volume equals mass. So I'll even have this on there. Now obviously if it's an honors or, or an AP type of class, this will not be on there. I'll just remind them, in this activity, you're going to be calculating the mass of the block. With this activity, what we have here would be five different types of plastic. Five different types of plastic. And this is actually a Flynn kit uh, because it's, I found it to be very difficult in, where I live in Ohio to try to find multiple types of plastic uh, that would be cut squarely. If you look over here, you'll notice the different colors of the blocks and the density values associated with those. Now, we do have the ability with this activity to teach significant figures or to use significant figures. And you'll see that we've taken great care in making sure that all density values have three significant figures. That will play out, again, if you're perhaps doing an honors chemistry class or an AP chemistry class, or perhaps even your regular chemistry class, significant figures may be very important. You could also do this activity in a physical science class where the, and just simply tell them, hey, round your final answers to three digits or three numbers, okay? But the density values are there. So when I do this activity, the kit comes with 30 different blocks in the five types of plastic, and I'll go around and I'll put a different block on each, or in front of each student. And there is tremendous excitement. Not so much because we're doing a measurement activity, it's for where I'm taking them. The activity, what I love about it is, and if you've ever had that class of 30, where you're trying to run around and you're trying to work with the students on the proper use of the ruler. You can't look over enough shoulders. There's too many sets of eyes with questions and so forth. What I love about this lab, 
I don't have to watch them make their measurements. I don't have to watch them do the calculations. All I have to do is stand by the electronic balance because what we'll have a volunteer do is he or she will come up and they're going to measure the length, the width, and the height of a block, calculate the volume, they're going to calculate the volume by taking the, the length, the width, the height, multiplying that to get the volume. They're going to multiply it by the known density value, and they're going to predict, hopefully accurately, the mass of the block. So I don't have to watch them do their calculations because I'll be the gatekeeper, so to speak, at the electronic balance. And what I love to say to the students, we're going to watch their grade happen in real time that the balance isn't going to lie. And so if you've ever had the students say, I tried, I really tried, or I double checked, I triple checked, I'm glad you did. Now let's put it on the balance and watch what happens with your grade. Um, will your grade go up or will it go down? Um, and it is great fun and lots of excitement here. So if we could have a volunteer from the audience, please come up. Have a calculator here for you. And I'd like for you to pick one of the blocks. Here's, here's the quality ruler. Okay, I select. And got a pen for you right there. Oh, you have one. All right. Flynn Scientific, yes. <laughs> now, while our volunteer is making his measurements, I try to think about what's the classroom look like. Right now, there's a heightened sense of excitement or anxiety when the students know that their grade depends upon how close their predicted mass is to what the electronic balance will show. So while I'm kind of standing here doing my thing, I've got various uh, sports type of music going. For instance, the Hay song. Um, Y'all ready for this? That's another good song. And that music's blaring. Again, we're trying to create uh, a, a real, I don't know, almost sports type of environment where we're trying to find out how good are your measurement skills. Now, what our volunteer would find out, or will soon find out, when we put that block on the balance, we're going to find out his grade. And I tell the students, normally the, the rule of thumb is never touch a student. But they have an opportunity that to have something so special that never gets put in my grade book. It is an opportunity for a high five. And I've had students say, I didn't care so much about the 10 out of 10. I really wanted the high five from my teacher. And I think, wow, if you stick around after class, I can do that. But uh, it means a lot to the students to have that opportunity. So what we're going to do is we'll take the block and let me zero the balance. Zero it. And I like to cover up the numbers here like this. And let's, what was the predicted mass? 102.07. 102, okay. 102 grams. Go ahead and put it on there, please. And how do you feel about this? You feeling, feeling pretty confident? Nervous. Nervous, okay. It's a 3%. I'll give you 3%. 3% difference, 3% error. You guessed 102. Ooh, <laughs> 101 to three significant figures. Difference of one divided by 101 equals times 100 equals 0.99% error. That is a master of measurement, a high five, very nicely done. Now, what I love about this, we're finding out his grade right now, right now, if something was drastically wrong. For instance, Maybe the volunteer started at the 10 centimeter mark and forgot to subtract out 10. Whoopsie daisy. Hey, go back and figure out where you went wrong. Another wonderful thing that can happen, the largest percent error I've ever gotten is over 500%. And that student was pretty proud of that, being in the Bracken Hall of Fame. But what he did, honors chemistry, honors chemistry, length times width, 
times length. Simple, simple error, but it can happen. And I know if you're like me, sometimes when I'm tired, oh my, did I do, oh my gosh, it happens. Okay? And in your own classroom, you may have to think about how will I accommodate that type of an error. But let's do a high five again for that. Awesome job. Thank you very much. Thanks. Now, again, some of the key features here, different density values. What I'm trying very hard in my own classroom, because I'll have students who may not be able to tell the difference between gray and black, I'll go the extra mile and I'll write the actual density values right on the blocks. I want the focus to be on making the measurements, doing the calculations. So I don't now white and waxy white. That is a legitimate question that students may have of which one is white, which one is waxy white. And this one would be white and this one is the waxy white. Okay? And there's, there's a definite difference in density. Okay? The difference in densities turns out to be so critical. The kit comes with 30 blocks. 30 blocks, one block for each student. They're flying solo. That alone can stress them. Can we work partners on that? No, each person gets a block. No, we really work well together. I know you do, and I'm glad for that, but now you're flying solo. Oh my. Now, some students will even say, awesome, I have been carrying this person for the longest time. <laughs> this is their time to prove that, okay? 30 blocks, uh, 30 different, it, the other thing, 30 different opportunities for success. The thing in working with Flynn, as we develop this kit, there are some things as a teacher that I think really helped in terms of input. First, let's use ugly numbers, not eight centimeters, where our students will just kind of look really fast and go, oh yeah, it's supposed to be eight. They, no, numbers like 8.22, oh, right. No two blocks have the same dimensions. That was an important thing. Cumbersome for the folks at Flynn, but in terms of creating a product where you can truly say, here's your block, Here's your block, here's your block, here's your block. Are these the same? No, they're not. And best of luck to you as you fly solo. If I strategically place the five different types of plastic around the room, I don't know of a way to cheat. As long as I have the only electronic balance in the room, come to Papa because here comes your grade. <laughs> We're going to watch it happen in real time. And, and there's an excitement there that is, is just amazing. And if you think about where we are in the course, measurement, not always that exciting at the argument, the discussion of is it 7.22 or 7.29 or 7.2. Tough to maybe make that subject come to life. The last thing that I want to mention, well, two things. One is the public performance. You're going to bring your block up, and in front of your class, you're going to, oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. That's like having to shoot a free throw in basketball in front of your team. Right. We're going to watch it happen. I think if you add the music, I think if you as a teacher set them up for success, how I try very hard to do that, we're going to come in, into class, before we start this activity where you're all flying solo, Here's what I want to work on. I want to measure the length of certain line segments, and I want to make sure that we're reading the ruler properly. As I tell them, if ever there was a time in your life where it really makes a difference with, with how you measure that, right now is that time. You're going to measure some line segments, and we're going to make sure that we're estimating to the right place on the ruler. Then we're going to go from the one dimension line segment to measuring the length of the uh, sides of a rectangle. And then we're going to calculate the area of a rectangle. So we're kind of reviewing measurement as well as the, the rules for significant figures and how we multiply things. We don't just keep all of the decimal places. Once they've done the one dimension line, the two dimension rectangle, they're really set up for success when we go to three dimensions. Finally, 
I want them to be successful. But they have to believe in their heart, he's willing to fail us if we do poorly. Yes. I've measured all the blocks. I got within 3% error. 3% error, I'll give that to you. You still get a 10 out of 10. Okay? And then I take off points along the way depending on how accurate they are. Percent uh, error. The last thing, if you teach multiple sections of the same class, I'll give three points extra credit to the best class, the Masters of Measurement. What percentage of perfect scores did I have in first period versus second period versus third period versus fifth period and so forth? At the end of the day, the winning class is going to get three points extra credit. Suddenly you've taken an individual activity and you've created a sense of team where they're going, hey, hey, you guys, double check. Hey, hey, really work to get, don't, double check. Before you go up to that balance, let's make sure that we all get 100% on this so that that way we get the extra credit. I think that type of class to class competition uh, is really good. In some cases, your morning classes will tell the afternoon class, for instance, hey, if you get the gray block, the mass is about 100. Never mind the fact that there are six different gray blocks. I want a gray one. I want a gray one. I want a gray one. Um, they may not get the same gray block. I've also had classes where they'll say, yeah, it's around 600 grams. And if our students don't think in terms of grams, well, they'll be like, how did second period think these blocks weighed 600 grams? So they're getting the wrong information, which is even better sometimes in terms of really uh, seeing that. But they take great pride in this with their measurement skills. So it's a nice way of using the concept of density to teach measurement and to hold the students accountable for perhaps uh, the measurement, the, the skills associated with the measurement unit. So uh, I love it. It's a great activity.